everyone. My name is Dr. Ahmed Sufyan Abdurrahman. I'm a consultant medical oncologist and uh, director of Cancer CRI Center. Uh, thank you for joining me this evening for this talk entitled uh, Molecular Profiling and Precision Oncology in the Landscape of Cancer Treatments. We will be having uh, six um, in this series, six talks in this series. This first talk will be the introduction uh, to the landscape of molecular profiling and precision oncology uh, for cancer. And uh, this program will be uh, uh, launched each month with uh, uh, each month covering uh, different types of tumor streams. So for this talk today, I shall share my screen. Okay. So just let uh, us uh, make a start. So the title today is Molecular Profiling and Precision Medicine in Cancer Treatments. So this is the agenda for our discussion today. We'll cover a bit uh, on the introduction and the history of cancer and genes. We will then dive into the molecular biology of cancer. And these two will actually build the backdrop for us to understand the cancer molecular profiling and precision oncology. And we will then deploy this understanding into the clinical application as a conduit to uh, the other five series that will follow each month. Uh, let me start by uh, telling you a, a bit more about the cancer and the cancer cells. And uh, one of the ways to actually uh, dive into this is actually by reading this book. This is a, a, a very interesting book written by a Professor Siddhartha Mukherjee uh, entitled The Emperor of All Maladies. It uh, actually captured the uh, history of uh, cancer discovery and uh, development. And there are a couple of quotes that um, uh, really intrigued me. The first one is on, uh, down to their innate molecular core, cancer cells are hyperactive, survival endowed, scrappy, fecund, inventive copies of our cells. And the second part, or the second quote is by Bernard Fisher, in God we trust, all others must have data. These two quotes really highlight the challenges we face in the field of cancer and the uh, property of evidence-based medicine that needs to be used in guiding molecular profiling and precision oncology treatments. Let me um, bring you back to the uh, history of a cancer discovery. Firstly, cancer is not a new disease. It's been spotted right back to the uh, 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 ancient Egypt time uh, in the uh, 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 bones of the mummies. Uh, what's found was the fossilized tumors and what's described in the papyrus during that time um, as this disease has no treatment. And throughout the history, um, physicians, uh, philosophers have been trying to uh, find the cause of cancer. For instance, Hippocrates came with the model of uh, humoral theory, and he thought that the imbalance between uh, four types of fluids in the body uh, led to the development of cancer. Stoll and Hoffman, for instance, thought that um, cancer uh, came from the uh, 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 lymphatic system or lymph fluid. And the finding by uh, John Hunter, um, the Scottish surgeon, which accentuated the idea of uh, cancer coming from the lymphatic system. Rudolf Virchow, for instance, the father of the cellular pathology, uh, thought that cancer came from the uh, irritation between uh, the cells. And Zacutus Lusitani and Nicholas Tull, for instance, thought that cancer is uh, caused by infections, for instance, viral infection and carcinogens. And from this understanding, at one point in the history, 
uh, patients diagnosed with cancer were um, isolated uh, from the rest of the population. Since then, um, the understanding of the genome has uh, advanced our understanding about the cancer biology, uh, which direct the um, early prevention, early detection, prognostication, and treatment. Today, cancer is the uh, oncology is uh, the most rapidly developing area uh, of medicine. And if you look at uh, this paper by the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the paper was trying to capture the progress over 200 years uh, 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 since the development or discovery of um, uh, cells and cancer. And I want to bring your attention not so much uh, to the leftmost side because we'll talk more about the uh, development in the genetic field. Uh, I just want to um, highlight the uh, middle um, illustration here that suggests that the carcinogens and the viruses uh, are associated with the development of cancer. So the exogenous factors, I call it, are associated with cancer. And if we look at these two diagrams here, rightly so, on the right side, we can see the normal gastric mucosa, for instance, when there is an exposure to the infection like Helicobacter pylori or inflammation, for instance, in the context of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And what can happen downstream is the cellular changes and also genetic changes, which then lead to the development of cancer. And if you look on the left side, you know what we uh, have been, have been um, exposed and we learn in the medical school, cancer starts from a normal cells that then change, uh, takes uh, the uh, evolution changes into these plastics, uh, uh, metaplastic and these plastic cells, which then continue to become the carcinoma in situ and continue to grow past the basement membrane and becomes uh, a, a, a malignant cancer uh, and has the uh, property of um, uh, spreading to the lymph nodes and distant organ. Now, a lot of people ask, or our patients might ask, you know, doctor, what causes cancer? So as we've alluded to, nowadays we can answer that much more confidently uh, because cancer is caused by the interactions of the envir uh, environmental exposures, the lifestyle factors, uh, the genomic bit, and of course the time factor. Recently, during the ASMO Congress 2022, there was an interesting, a very interesting uh, fi finding being um, presented, which showed the mechanistic linkage between the um, air pollution with the particulate matters of 2.5 micrometers upwards and um, the release of the interleukin 1b in normal lung tissues harboring EGFR mutation. So what it really shows here is the interaction between the uh, exogenous factors and the endogenous factors, which is the genes and the genome uh, in actually leading to the development of cancer. Let us now drill uh, uh, further into the uh, world of uh, genetic uh, to get a better insight on how we've now reached to the era of molecular profiling and precision oncology. Firstly, um, from the Charles Darwin and then later to the uh, uh, Mandel, uh, Mandel um, the law of the uh, genetic inheritance uh, was um, found at that time, although um, early on people didn't know about uh, genes, DNA, and so on. What happened then across the uh, timeline here, uh, and more and more uh, earlier 
understanding of cells, the cellular uh, cycles, the chromosomes, the um, genes, the DNA, and so on were built. So I've actually summarized that a bit more on the uh, right side, just to give uh, a clearer uh, picture. And how the early understanding of the cells and leading to the understanding of the DNA and then the exponential uh, increase further uh, during the period of this human genome project has led us to understand how genes play a very important role in, in, in the phenotypic expression and in the cellular function and, of course, in the development of diseases, including cancer. The other uh, important uh, part in the uh, genetic and genomic um, uh, history is the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. So this uh, project was conducted under National Institute of Health as well, where they look at, uh, they gathered the uh, different types of tumor. Initially, it was started with 12 tumor types, but then in, uh, in 2015, uh, as many as 33 different types of cancer uh, were included and having over 11,000 of uh, tumor tissues. What they did, they look at the, uh, uh, the NA, RNA um, uh, mutations, epigenetic mutations, proteomic mutations, and they collect as well the clinical data. So they collect all this information and they look into um, uh, the cell of origin, the tumorigenesis, the evolution of cancer, and also the signaling pathways and the mutations that could occur in uh, those pathways. What has become a game changer is that with this uh, Cancer Genome Atlas project, they don't only look at a specific histological lineage of cancer, but they look the mutational pattern across different types of cancer. So this is where we start moving from the histological typing of cancer to the molecular uh, subtyping of cancers or the tumor agnostic approach. So rule number one is that cancer is a genomic disease. Cancer cells are genomically unstable. So what does this mean? So if we go into the molecular biology of cancer, nowadays we understand that what um, leads to the growth, differentiation, propagation, uh, and metastasis of cancer is likely what's called as cancer stem cells. These cancer stem cells, they have got a very um, dynamic and plastic property in that they can differentiate into mature cells. So here, for example, it becomes tumor progenitor and then tumor cells. And the tumor cells can actually de-differentiate back into these cancer stem cells. Similar, this, uh, similarly, these cancer stem cells, it can actually come from the uh, normal stem cells, or it can come from the uh, tumor cells or it can come from the somatic cells that mutate becomes cancer stem cells. So if you look on the left here, this creates what's called as the um, uh, tumor heterogeneity. So you can have the initial clone that form one subclone and a different subclone and different subclone and so on. So what we are seeing here across the tumor uh, growth and development we are seeing the evolution of the genes and the genome and the evolution of the cells, which creates the heterogeneity, not only within uh, a single site. So it could be either, uh, 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 it can be the intratumoral heterogeneity that we have, also intertumoral heterogeneity and intersites heterogeneity. Now let's uh, drill a bit deeper. So one is we're talking about here heterogeneity of the tumors. But tumors, uh, tumor cells are like normal cells initially. 
they have their intracellular signaling pathways that um, lead them to continue to survive. So the normal cells have these pathways. So if I can show you, so for instance, the beta catenin pathway, the PI3K pathway, the RAS pathway, and a lot of these pathways. On the left here, these pathways lead to the cell growth and proliferation. Uh, the path, there's also path pathways that lead to the apoptosis and cellular death, and also signaling, signaling pathways that control the metabolic activities of the cells. Now, in cancer cells, what happened is that the oncogenic um, uh, addiction, uh, 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 on oncogen addicted mutations can occur in some of these pathways, rendering the cancer cells to be dependent on these pathways and continuing to grow and to proliferate. To build the complexity of the overall picture further, the tumor or the cells live in their environment called a tumor microenvironment. And the cells for that matter, do interact with the surrounding cells in that environment, including the fibroblasts, the innate immune cells, and the blood vessels. And we can see a lot of signaling occur between the uh, uh, other cells and the tumor cells, as well as the complex signaling pathways that occur in the cells. This actually um, raises the question, uh, if traditionally we've been treating cancer with chemotherapy, understanding these complexities, it means that the single treatment uh, fits all might not be the best. But we could actually take the advantage of uh, un uh, the understanding of these pathways to target certain pathways that these cancer cells are relying on to actually kill these cancer cells uh, and sparing the normal cells. Uh, that leads to rule number two, uh, which is the philosophy of cancer treatments is differentiating between cancer cells versus normal cells. What chemo, this is what chemotherapy is lacking beyond the grade of tumor differentiation. So pure, poorly uh, differentiated cancer uh, would respond much better to chemotherapy rather than the well-differentiated cancer, but above and beyond that, there's not much differentiation in terms of the chemotherapy effects on the normal cells and cancer cells. Now, let's drill back into this uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, um, because we mentioned last time this project has transformed in some ways our understanding of cancer uh, subtyping from the histological subtyping to molecular subtyping. So if you look on the right side here, we've got um, different types of cancer uh, based on the histological types. And what the projects look at, they look at the canonical pathways, the important recognized pathways in the uh, uh, cells, in the tumor cells, or, or in the normal cells as well. And they look at the frequency of mutations that can be seen in the different pathways. That creates the understanding that hmm, in different types of tumor, there could be uh, uh, mutations, similar mutations in some on, of the pathways, which create, uh, created the idea that we could potentially target the pathways regardless of the tumor histology. On the left side, this is the canonical pathways. As we go down further uh, during our series, you would see how some of these pathways, the mutations and the proteins were targeted with the drugs that then changes the, this uh, pathway uh, activation and um, affects the tumor growth uh, progression and survival. One of the complexities in these pathways, they don't actually exist in isolation. So one pathway actually does cross-talk to the other pathway of pathways. Uh, 
This is where the complexities come in because um, when we target with a, a specific uh, cancer drug, uh, there is a potential for uh, escape pathways or amplification of the other pathways. Now, if we put all this understanding together, essentially what we have is cancer cells and what we call here as the tumor microenvironment uh, with the blood vessels, fibroblasts, the immune cells, and so on. And the signaling pathways, the way the cancer uh, cells interact with them uh, makes us understand that these are the potential avenues that the cancer cells use to continue to survive. So for instance, avoiding immune destruction, evading growth suppressions, sustaining proliferative signaling, and so on and so forth. The idea is therefore, if we can target you know, one or more of these um, features of cancer or hallmarks of cancer, we hope to be changing the trajectory of the tumor growth and for that matter, the progression of the tumors. And we hope to be improving the survival of patients. And while doing so, we want to make sure that our treatments uh, would be uh, less toxic or have uh, a better or favorable toxicities, would have a, a, a better uh, ease and compliance for patients towards medications. So for instance, using the targeted therapy uh, taking it uh, as tablet medications uh, would uh, hopefully have better compliance when compared to patients uh, coming to the hospital and having chemotherapy. And we hope that given the different side effects profile, the ability to differentiate between tumor cells and normal cells, that would hopefully give a better quality of life for patients. So this is where we come back to the um, idea of what is molecular profiling. So we'll come back to the title of our presentation. So molecular profiling is the process of profiling the cellular molecules in order to understand their signature characteristics and functions. What does that mean? It means that we can use the biotechnology to sequence either uh, at the genetic level or at the messenger RNA level, at the protein or glycoprotein level, or uh, at the metabolic product level. The thing is that we could sequence or we could um, uh, check for either a single molecule right till the entire molecule. So from a single gene to what we call as genomic, from uh, uh, one mRNA to transcriptomic, one protein to proteomics and one metabolite to metabolomics. The thing with the molecular profiling as well, we can profile single cell or rectal to multiple cells. And the reason we profile, there are a few. So the first one is to understand the evolution uh, of these uh, cancer cells. For the molecular characterization that we've mentioned, for prognostic information, uh, for finding differentiation between normal cells and cancer cells so that we can uh, utilize that for uh, targeting uh, the, the, the cancer cells. And if we put the um, cellular diagnostic modalities development in a simplistic uh, diagram here, we know that initially we got to see the cell under the microscope uh, and then we start to be able to examine the karyot uh, karyotopes and then the what we call as a, a, chrom a chromosomal microarray uh, the fish has to look at the section of the uh, chromosomes and then comes the technology of a Sanger sequencing where we are able to look at each base pair of the um, DNA uh, because the Sanger sequencing, what it does is it actually tags uh, uh, different types of dye uh, to uh, different base pairs that allows for the sequencing and for uh, the DNA sequence, uh, each base uh, pair to be read uh, 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 when the sequencing is done. 
as well as that, the development of polymerase chain reaction that helps to amplify uh, sections of the DNA, and then the development of the next generation sequencing or massively uh, parallel sequencing, which actually speed up the ability for us to sequence a large section of DNA or even the whole genome. Now, then what is a cancer genomic profiling? So this is where we drill and we start looking at you know, the process of what's called as next generation sequencing just now. So the concept is that um, we take the DNA, we uh, fragment the DNA, we amplify the DNA, and we read the whole DNA. So that's the, the, the idea of the next generation sequencing and how it evolves from the Sanger sequencing plus minus the PCR and help us in our ability to read uh, each base of the DNA in, in, uh, in a rapid fashion. So the process goes like this in a simplistic way. So we've got the cancer tissue or the liquid biopsy. Uh, in this process, the pathologists and the oncologists will need to ensure that the tissue sample uh, is sufficient. So this is where the uh, liaison with the uh, anatomical pathologists or interventional radiologists would be important and liaison with the lab uh, carrying out the next generation sequencing would be important because there could be uh, subtle uh, differences in terms of the amount of tissue that's required. And then what happens once the tissue is uh, obtained and you know the cells uh, were broken or lysed and the DNA and RNA were um, acquired, uh, there will be a quality control done to see the quality of the and DNA and RNA and whether uh, it is good enough for further process of next generation sequencing to go on. The next process is what's called as the library preparation. I'll show you in a video shortly. Library preparation essentially means that we've got like a platform or what's called as a flow cell. This is where the fragmented DNA after the, the previous process is tagged to what's called as adapters. And then they are tagged to these flow cells and then they are amplified. So this is actually, you know, the preparing the, the platform um, before the sequencing is done. And the platform is then sequenced in the sequencing machine. And this is where the DNA um, sequences, um, uh, you will have the base, uh, the uh, nucleic acid bases tagged to dyes and uh, the sequencing happen. And then the reads will come uh, in the computer showing, you know, the, the, the sequence A, C, T, G of the uh, basis and so on, uh, depending on the genes being tested and the uh, length of the DNA uh, being, being tested. After that, the bioinformatic reads, um, or, uh, once that's done, then the uh, abnormal mutations will be detected and um, the abnormal mutations will be compared uh, and reviewed um, against the databases, uh, genomic, uh, genetic databases, and classifications uh, will be made as to whether this mutation is you know, benign, likely benign, or variant of unknown significance, um, uh, likely pathogenic or pathogenic. So this is a, this is a simplistic way of uh, uh, just explaining just to make it uh, clearer to the viewers. And what happened then, based on this pathogenic mutation found, then the uh, evidences will be looked at. For instance, you know, have we got established treatment for this particular mutation uh, as recorded and published in the guidelines or in the databases? And that is what's called as the tiering of the evidences where the uh, mutations will be paired with the drugs and the level of the evidences will be uh, marked there, level one, two, three, four, and different uh, labs would have slightly different way of tiering the evidences. And then the curation of report will be made by the lab and sent to the physician. Uh, to make it um, uh, clearer in terms of, you know, 
how library processing and sequencing is done, I will play this video um, um, now. Hello and welcome to today's talk about next generation sequencing, which is also known as massively parallel or just deep sequencing. Next generation sequencing has completely revolutionized genome analysis. With next gen sequencing, it is possible to sequence an entire human genome in just one day. We start with the sample preparation. Once we have isolated our DNA, we need to generate smaller fragments. Now all of these DNA fragments will get ligated to certain oligonucleotides. There are two types here. These include sequencing binding sites and also an additional complementary sequence which can then hybridize to the flow cell. First, our DNA double-stranded fragment is denaturated. So in theory, the whole genome should be in fragments and all of the fragments have attached two different types of binding sites on each end. All the DNA fragments are now applied on a ship, the so-called flow cell. And as you can see here, there are two types of complementary sequences, the blue ones and the red ones in our example. The DNA fragments will at this end hybridize with the flow cell as applied to the plate. To make this easier, we just look at one fragment. The first step here on the flow cell is the DNA amplification. By polymerase chain reaction, the complementary sequence to our single stranded DNA fragment is synthesized. This process, which we have seen here, is done simultaneously for all DNA fragments on the whole flow cell. Now the DNA is denatured and the single strand, which is not attached to the flow cell's oligonucleotides, gets washed away. The next step is called bridge building. You may have noticed that we have two different types of oligonucleotides here, and the second type of oligo will now also hybridize to one of the sticky oligonucleotides on the plate. This process is called bridge building. The DNA is now amplified again, so a polymerase will synthesize the complementary sequence again. This whole process is called bridge amplification. The DNA is denatured, but now you can see that both fragments stick to the plate. The whole procedure will just repeat now. The DNA fragment will build a bridge again. And again, we also have the bridge amplification. That whole process will be repeated for several rounds. And this here is the result. So out of one DNA fragment, we generated multiple copies by PCR. We have reverse and we have forward strands from our copy here. One of these strands here is cleaved now and sequencing can begin. For sequencing, we just look at one copy now. As mentioned in the beginning, a primer can bind to the oligonucleotides. So this is a sequencing binding site here. Sequencing is now done with specific nucleotides. These nucleotides in this case are fluorescently labeled. Only one of them will fit. In this case, the T. The fluorescently labeled T will then be excited by a laser and the fluorescent signal is obtained. This is done with a color code. So we know that in this case, blue is T. In the next case, the A will join. Again, the fluorescently labeled A is excited and we will receive a signal again, this time an A. This whole procedure is done for all of the nucleotides one by one. And this is how we get the sequence. For simplification purposes, we just look at one of these copies. Now notice that due to PCR, we have several copies. So many light signals are obtained simultaneously. The last step now is the data analysis. So here informatic tools are required. The whole process of next gen sequencing generated millions and billions of reads. These reads are now overlaid and compared to a reference genome. And by this overlay, we can now generate the whole genome sequence. This was it. I thank you very much for watching. I put two Okay, so let's continue. Um, right. Interesting videos. 
Okay, so with molecular profiling, there are different types. Um, as mentioned, it could be from a single gene right to the whole genome sequencing. So with a single gene, this is where, you know, during the early days, we look at uh, one single mutation, for example, EGFR mutation, and the polymerase chain reaction can, uh, uh, can be done to look for that particular mutation in cancer cells. We've also got what's called as hotspot genetic panel, where we look at uh, a number of um, relevant uh, 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 genetic um, uh, mutations uh, for cancer cells. But uh, the testing is not comprehensive. So which means, for example, if we have lung cancer, we uh, do 3, 4 EGFR, uh, we do um, um, uh, MET uh, uh, or uh, ARC and ROS. And then we might miss uh, some other um, new onco uh, gene driver mutations. So the testing is not comprehensive. The comprehensive genomic profiling, what it means is that you've got several hundred uh, genes uh, that's relevant in the context of cancer. Um, it could be uh, somatic or germline mutations. And what you have is you look at all uh, 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 types of mutations that could occur to the genes. So it could be insertion, deletion, uh, it could be the uh, uh, um, uh, so uh, CNAs, a, a single uh, nutri nucleotide variant, um, uh, copy number alterations, fusion, uh, 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 or rearrangement uh, that can occur uh, on the on the DNA sequence. So uh, that's why it's called as comprehensive genomic profiling. So you do a single case, it covers 300 genes relevant to cancer and um, uh, the likelihood of uh, finding the um, uh, genetic alterations relevant to cancer will be much higher. We also have a whole exome sequencing where it tests all functional part of the genome which made up the um, uh, one percent, so the exome of the uh, of the genome. So it's about twenty thousand genes and thirty four megabases. Um, uh, this is good, and um, the only thing is that the cost and the uh, time, especially the bioinformatic time, to uh, to to interpret it. Uh, and also now more and more, the the field is moving towards the whole genome sequencing. In fact, this is really going to be valuable. Uh, going forward because you got the whole um, information uh, of the genome of uh, different types of cancer. Um, so um, uh, this is really going to be a game changer, hopefully. Uh, but at this stage, uh, at the clinical level, uh, we're using uh, different, uh, this different of uh, four uh, different types of, uh, uh, four different types of profiling as mentioned. Some of the terminologies that uh, people need to be aware of with molecular profiling is um, germline versus somatic, a percentage of viable tumor cells, uh, tissue versus liquid biopsy, uh, the concept of tumor mutational burden. So th this is looking at you know um, the uh, uh, um, how many megabases that you have in terms of the D DNA sequence and how many uh, somatic mutations. Uh, they call it uh, non-synonymous or oncogene driver mutations you can find uh, for that um, length of um, DNA. Uh, microsatellite instability, level of significance of mutations that we've mentioned before and tearing of evidences. So this uh, uh, would come on and off in, in, in the lab report uh, that people get from the genomic or genetic sequencing. Now let's move uh, to uh, to uh, precision medicine. So precision medicine, and we move to precision medicine in oncology. Uh, initially, um, the term personalized medicine uh, has been uh, more popular. What it means is that you're targeting, you're providing the medication based on the patient's clinical factors, uh, the demographic factors, the drug factors, you know, the um, you know the pharmacodynamics or pharmacokinetics. Um, the tolerance, the compliance, and so on. The precision medicine, really, the, the tandem changes more towards the precision medicine, and in the literature, it has been used interchangeably, I think, from the 2011 onwards. 
But uh, precision medicine really uh, uh, means uh, the personalized medicine, but uh, with the inclusion of more and more molecular information. So whether it is genomics, proteomics, um, epigenomics, uh, and so on. And we're moving from what's called as personomics um, uh, before, you know, personalized medicine using the factors I've mentioned before. Uh, now with the inclusion of the uh, molecular data, but not only to affect the uh, prevention, early detection, treatment, prognostication at the individual level, but also at the population level. So the closest example is the COVID-19 we've got, where you know the uh, uh, RNA information from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus is really important and has been um, a sequence uh, uh, periodically to look for the variant development. And the mRNA vaccine was developed from the, uh, you know, the sequencing uh, technology and the ability to put the, the, the uh, RNA sequence of the virus uh, and to inject the vaccine in the, in the human body. And what we're talking about in the precision medicine in oncology is moving from the concept of the of using chemotherapy alone, uh, targeting the cell cycle or the non-cell cycle um, uh, 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 therapy, to treatments guided by the molecular profile of cancer cells. So it uh, could still be uh, some sort of chemotherapy or tyrosine kinase inhibitors or immunoglobulins, but really it targets the specific molecules or pathways as what we've showed um, before. So the effectiveness of treatment is no longer a, a, a function or a combination of you know, clinical factors, demographic factors, and histology only, but the addition of the molecular information and, you know, the genomic level, proteomic level, transcriptomic level, and so on, uh, to uh, uh, improve the effectiveness and, and the efficacy of treatments. So what I'm saying here is more and more, um, we are moving towards the computational matter um, to um, try to see whether treatments uh, would improve the outcomes. So at an individual level, it's a, a use of more and more Bayesian um, a model of the statistics. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, in fact, it has been done. They have, there are uh, 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 softwares now. Um, uh, it is, is now a move uh, of, uh, towards using the machine learning and AI, incorporating the big data, smart data, molecular information uh, to predict response to targeted therapy and treatments. We're not really um, clinically quite there yet, but um, the um, uh, precision oncology is now standard of care um, uh, 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 using the different drugs uh, based on the biomarker. So this is showing you the trajectory just from the 2019 until today, just to show you how many drugs have been developed to target uh, a certain types of the uh, oncogenic driver mutations. It's worth mentioning that um, BCR ABLE was the um, uh, uh, translocation that was uh, first found that led to the development of imatinib, uh, what I call as the father of the uh, uh, precision oncology. Uh, it targets this um, translocation in the chronic myeloid leukemia uh, and gives uh, the best overall survival in terms of the targeted therapy until today. Although the finding, the time period from the BCR able, uh, uh, the finding of BCR able to the approval of imatinib, it took about 41 years. Similarly, herceptin was approved in 1998 uh, to, uh, to target the HER2 receptor in, in breast cancer. So nowadays, a worldwide oncology standard of care, we can see with uh, different uh, uh, oncogene driver mutations found, the use of the targeted therapy changes the outcomes for cancer patients. So for instance, in flora or the uh, used in lung cancer, 
when compared to the previous generation, Tarasenkanis inhibitor improved the survival outcomes. Similarly, in solar for breast cancer in patients harboring PIK3CA mutation, the Keynote 1077 looking at the use of the immune checkpoint inhibitor in patients with uh, DMMR or MSI high. Uh, and also solo one uh, looking at the use of the PARP inhibitor Olaparib in patients who harbor the um, BRCA1, BRCA2 uh, germline uh, uh, slash somatic mutations also for the homologous recombinant deficiency patients. Uh, in beacon trial in, uh, for colon cancer, uh, similarly, um, uh, the use of the uh, benimatinib and, and, and carafenib um, improved the survival outcomes. And that's the use of the single gene biomarker. And when you apply the targeted therapy, you'll see the outcome. For the use of the multi-gene panels, we also start seeing, although initially the SHIVA trial that was done in France, the result was negative. Uh, further trials, for instance, impact done by the National Institute of Health, uh, they showed the positive survival uh, results uh, in patients who've, who haven't got any other treatments or, or towards the end uh, uh, of line of treatments for their cancer when the molecular profiling uh, using the multigen panel, panels were used um, and matched with therapy, the survival outcomes for these patients improved. Similarly, prevail for lung cancer patients in China. They did the molecular profiling and they made match that with the um, clinical trials or targeted therapy of clinical trials. And you start seeing uh, that patient match with therapy have better survival outcomes. Similar result uh, uh, for my study uh, that was done in Spain. So in essence, uh, internationally, there have been initiatives uh, on molecular profiling and precision oncology in various countries. Um, essentially, although the models in different countries could differ uh, slightly, the concept is you do molecular profiling and you uh, link that to patient assistance program or compassion access program or clinical trials or real world outcome studies. Uh, you try to expand the treatment uh, options and treatment recommendations for patients. And we hope that uh, that would improve the survival outcomes and quality of life. Now let's put that in the clinical context. Given these complexities, uh, people would say, why precision oncology? And the reason for that is one, uh, the uh, use of targeted therapy gives uh, patients a different side effect profile. It gives patients a better quality of life. Uh, for some cancers and some genetic mutations, it gives uh, uh, great response rates, uh, better survival outcomes for certain mutations and cancers, uh, uh, accessibility to take these medications by linking uh, the mutations found to clinical trials or available therapy. Um, and what you need to do is to consider though these three factors, the human factors, the biological factors, and treatment factors. The human factors uh, mean that you look at the quality of life of patients when given this therapy, the survival outcomes they could uh, benefit from having this therapy, of course, the financial toxicity is being on this therapy and what would be the opportunity cost. The biological factors mean that you look at the adverse events uh, 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 from the cancer. So this depends on the tumor burden harbored by patients. And of course, the cumulative adverse events over time and the treatment factors mean that you look at the treatment related adverse events when you deliver this precision oncology and of course the rate of treatment associated discontinuation and death. So what we're trying to do is rather than putting a molecular profiling uh, a late in a patient's journey, as we know in oncology the rule is you know if you introduce the treatment towards the uh, later lines of uh, a, a patient's a sequence of therapy, then the likelihood of response is much less. Uh, then the, the idea is to do the molecular profiling early and for some cancers to do that upfront because that would determine the pathways of treatments that you would take, including the use of the innovative cancer drugs 
linking to the clinical trials and pushing the chemotherapy further and further back. So the take home messages, the first one, can, cancer is a genomic disease and occurred as a result of cumulative genomic scarring that occurred over time. Second, molecular profiling provides better understanding on the subcharacterization and function of cancer cells, which allows, us, uh, uh, which allows for prevention, early detection, prognostication, and treatment by targeting specific pathways. There are various types of gen genetic profiling, uh, and it can be uh, decided based on the clinical context. Comprehensive genomic profiling would be a good surrogate to whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing to ensure the capture of all relevant actionable oncogene addicted mutations. Last but not least, position oncology improves the quality of life and survival outcomes of cancer patients and has been adopted as a standard of care in oncology practice. So that's the uh, end of the presentation. I just want to inform the audience that uh, we will be having uh, this talk as a series. So uh, next month, there will be a talk uh, drilling uh, uh, deep into the treatment landscape of lung cancer, followed by the colorectal cancer, breast cancer, ovarian and gynecological cancers. And last um, uh, series, uh, last um, session will be on sarcoma and rare cancers. So I say thank you very much, and I shall uh, open the session for a Q and A. Right, so it looks like um, we haven't got any questions so far from the uh, from the chat platform. Uh, so we'll give a few minutes um, and see whether there will be questions coming through. Yeah, so in essence, uh, the molecular profiling is um, a part of the standard of care uh, for cancer treatments uh, these days. And the beauty of doing that is uh, the analogy would be like, you know, having a map and understanding, you know, what mutations do the cancer cells harbor, uh, uh, which would help you to one sequence uh, your treatments. Number two, it would help you with prognostication. Uh, so some of the genetic mutations give the prognostic information. And of course, the molecular profiling can also be used uh, to detect for the resistance mutation. So if patients have got the treatments being given and the disease or the cancer continues to grow, molecular profiling can be done uh, to look for what uh, is or are the resistance mutations, uh, which would help uh, the uh, oncologists uh, to plan for the treatments uh, with the patients. Uh, molecular profiling can also be used uh, for uh, germline testing. So for instance, if uh, uh, a patient has got a diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer, uh, she's young, um, and then uh, molecular or genetic testing can be done uh, to look whether uh, she harbors what's called as a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations or some other uh, pathogenic uh, mutations that uh, like PLAP2 um, and other mutations that would suggest one, prognostic information, number two, uh, hereditary uh, information which will have uh, implications on the, you know, the nucleus family uh, and also the extended family. And this is where, again, uh, having the genetic uh, counseling um, before testing and after testing uh, would be important. 
Okay, so I think um, uh, looking at the um, chat box again, um, Okay, so it looks like we haven't got any other question. Uh, in uh, next month, we'll be talking in detail on lung cancer and precision oncology in lung cancer. And this is going to be really interesting because lung cancer is uh, uh, the cancer where this molecular profiling is, is really relevant. And a lot of the targeted therapies have been found uh, to be uh, efficacious. Uh, in uh, targeting and changing the pathways uh, for the lung cancer cells and improving the outcomes for patients. So I might stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aisha, for, um, uh, for uh, the comments. Yes, I uh, hope that it would be uh, beneficial um, to you. Okay, so uh, just closing the session, I uh, uh, just want to take this opportunity again to thank the National Cancer Society of Malaysia uh, uh, for these wonderful uh, uh, collaborative uh, sessions to increase the awareness on the cancer molecular profiling and precision oncology. Uh, and of course, if um, the audience have more questions, uh, do visit our uh, website, uh, HTTPS. Uh, cancercicenter.com. Uh, you can also contact us via our WhatsApp uh, 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 for any questions related uh, to uh, this uh, molecular profiling uh, and precision oncology. Thank you.